Yeah, I guess freedom can be messy, right? So I, I don't know about you, but today I think it's one of those days when the way we respond back to God, the, our worship, right? That's what worship is, is responding back to who God is. Today's worship is very poignant because we're going to talk about being messy. And if, you know, this is the third Sunday of the month. So if you're new to Agape, what this means is the third Sunday of the month. We go out and we worship the Lord by doing something and not just listening me, you know, blah, 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 talk, right? All right, because we all know that when it's all said and done, more has been said than done. Yes? So today we have the opportunity to worship the Lord by doing. What are we going to do? Well, we'll probably, Dan will tell you all about it, but one of the, you know, some of you, are going to go on the side of a road and clean up messy things. Others of you will stay behind and paint what I call make me smile rocks, right? And that might be messy too. Life is messy, ain't it? Yeah, last night we were sitting you know, on the patio and, you know, we're enjoying what we're doing and it's lovely, but it got messy. The reason it got messy because these agents of Satan that came out in the evening called mosquitoes, and, and I got bit all over the place. It, life is messy. Even when things are good, there's an agent of Satan that comes and bites you or something. We've been um, exploring, going through the poetry of the book of Lamentations. And the poetry in the book of Lamentations, let's just say it's messy. It's messy because it, it, it covers things like sadness. And well, that's why I guess preachers don't, don't, you know, don't go after that because it's sort of messy. Um, now, if my technology will work here, I will have my notes out. But if my notes don't work, guess what? We're in for a long sermon. Um, there we go. My notes worked. You're in luck. <laughs> All right. What I want to do is I want to read the text. And uh, you know what? I'm going to use my paper Bible instead of my electronic today. I, I, um, let's see here. By the way, if you want to follow along, you can find Lamentations. Uh, Lamentations, and I'm going to show you. Lamentations is a book in the first part of the Bible, you know, so if you sort of go like this, you know, like this, it's more, right? It's, or, or just, here, here's the other thing you can do. Just go in the table of contents. Okay, so table of contents, it's, to, it's okay to, to do that. It's no big deal, right? So Lamentations is, um, is it's in there somewhere. Once you find it, we're going to find Lamentations chapter 5. And there was, um, not that long ago, somebody asked me, like, Pastor, what's with the big numbers and what's with the little numbers in the, in the Bible? I said, well, the big numbers are called chapters and the little numbers are called verses. And that's how we sort of maneuver in, in the scriptures. So if you find Lamentations chapter 5, and I'm going to read what the poetry says. By the way, this is, this is poetry, so you're going to find all sorts of poetic imagery here. And what I want to do is I will cover the text in its context. Then we're going to go through what it means to us today in 21st century. And then after that, we're going to go into what we're going to do about it. Because, you know, we don't want to just go in one ear and out the other. Remember what I said about more than has been said than done. So we want to do some actions as well after that. So what I want to do is as I read the text, um, if you've been with us, uh, covering uh, the, the poetry in Lamentations, you'll, you'll hear the same kinds of themes. And I'll point them out as I go through, but they, you'll see themes of, of national disgrace. The, the, and, and the context for, for the poetry here is Israel has been conquered. Jerusalem has been destroyed. And the poet is just heartbroken. Because the entire nation has been carried off to Babylon. Whatever is left is just horrible. 
I mean, again, national disgrace on the international scene. There's poverty. There's, there's famine. There's enemy occupation. There, the temple is destroyed. So people are like, okay, the temple is destroyed. Where's God? You know, because gods in the ancient times were in the temple. So, so there's lawlessness, lawlessness everywhere from the legal and economic systems just completely collapsed to atrocities, atrocities. And you'll see the poem talk about atrocities. And then um, just a general pattern of sin throughout the generations. They're going to admit, hey, we are in this spot because of our forefathers and because of us. All right, so they're, they're in this kind of like a rebellion against the Most High, and it's generational. And of course, that's the overall theme of hopelessness. But let me let me just read it, and, and I'm going to point some things out as we go through. So the poem in chapter 5, I would call it a chaotic poem in comparison to all the other poems. All the other poems in the book were have a nice structure. Each one started with the letter of the alphabet. Ancient Jewish alphabet, not American. Okay, let's get into the context. And now chapter 5 is a little bit chaotic. Imagine this person at the end of their heartbreak. Okay, and this is what the poet says. Remember, Lord, remember what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our home to foreigners. We have become fatherless. Our mothers are widows. We must buy the water we drink. In other words, my own well. I got to pay for my own well. Out of, out of my own well. Our own wood ha can be o uh, had only at a price. Those who pursue us are at our heels. They are weary and find no rest. We submitted to Egypt and uh, Assyria to get enough bread. This is, by the way, a horrible, horrible, in their mind, a horrible humiliation to be under the thumb of Egypt and Assyria. I mean, they must have been at their lowest low in order to just go that low, all right? Uh, we submitted to Egypt. No, uh, verse 7, our ancestors sin are on no more, and we bear their punishment. By the way, this is where I have to stop. It's not saying, hey, they did it wrong. How come we pay for it? Right? There's not what's, what's saying. The poetry here is they did it, and we're doing it, and we are bearing the punishment of us all. That's what this poetry says here. Slaves rule over us, and there's no one to free us from their hands. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the desert. Key term right there, sword in the desert. What's going on? Well, you know, just imagine the desert right in the Middle East. There were nomads. of, you know, There were no good nomads. No good nomads. I like that. All right. So no good nomads, right? They're, they're, they're going out there, and there's lawlessness because you go out, and guess what? They're going to attack you. Why? Might made right in the ancient times and even today in some circles. All right, so they go out, uh, they risk their lives to get bread because of the sword in the desert. Number 10, our skin is hot as an oven, feverish from hunger. There's your famine. Women, okay, uh, atrocities coming up. Okay, the trash is coming up. Uh, verse 11, women have been violated in Zion and virgins in the town of Judah. That's atrocities, people. Princes, here's another atrocities. Princes have been hung by their hands. Elders are shown no respect. Young men toil at the millstones. This is slaves, right? Boys stagger under loads of wood. This is child, child, sla child labor, child slavery. 14, the elders are gone from the city gate. Ah, so what's the big deal? They're no longer at the gate. Ah, ha, ha. At the gate is where they did all their, their, their legal commerce. You, you, had, you had a contract, you go to the city gates. Why? The elders are there. And you have the, the legal court. So it's not just, oh yeah, they left there, you know, the gate. No, 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 no. This is the social structure, the legal structure, the economic structure collapsing here. So the elders are gone from the city gates. They're, they're no longer, at, you know, in the courts. That's really what it is. The young men have stopped their music. Joy 
is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. See that? They're not saying, oh, yeah, my grandpa sinned, so I get to bear the punishment. Oh, no, 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 no. The poet knows they're in it as well. They rebelled against the Most High God. And here's number 17. And this is pregnant with emotion. Because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim. They don't see the future. From Mount Zion, which lies desolate, with jackals prowling over it. Mount Zion, that's the temple. Where's God? We have wild animals here. And in spite of that, the poet continues, You, Lord, right? In spite of all this, you, Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us for so long? Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days of old. Unless, of course, you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. Oh, boom! I mean, take your heart, skewer it, barbecue it. You're done. I mean, this is, this is, this is such emotion. This is like, I, I mean, I'm in a messy world here. See, even, even, even in all this messiness, the poet says, wait, wait, I, I'm overwhelmed with everything that's happening around me, but I got I to gotta remember one thing, that the Lord, the Lord reigns eternal. So in response to the social collapse, this generational pattern of sin, the poet says, from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation, the Most High God is still on the throne. See, the poet is showing here trust in the midst of doubt, in the midst of unknown. And do you ever feel that? That you're like, okay, stuff is happening. And in the midst of what's coming next, whether it's a diagnosis, whether it's a loved one gone, whether somehow when the rug gets pulled out of you, from under you, you got to go, uh, uh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And in the midst of that, the poet is saying, but wait, I gotta trust. I gotta, I gotta bring my mind into this trust. And of course, then, then the poet ends with this hanger, this, this holding you over the head and it's not resolved. And you go, what in the world? You know, Lord, have mercy on us unless you've utterly rejected us, unless or are angry with us beyond measure. See, this is. Oh, it stops there, but it requires the reader to come up with an answer. There's this tension that the poet puts out there, and it begs an answer. Has God broke his promises? Is God breaking continually his promises? Has he forgotten? See, the poet is not unlike what we engage with because we, when things happen, we get tempted to say, wait a minute. All those promises, I mean, you've seen those fun books that, you know, the promises of God. You go there and you flip and, oh, he loves you. He cherishes you. Oh, he's going to take care of you. Oh, you just feel like, you know, getting a cup of tea and putting your feet up and just reading. That's so lovely. And then when things happen, you go, but this 
this lovely picture book with flowers and teacups and all that is telling me that he loves me, but I am feeling like I'm being crushed. Where's God in that moment? See, it requires an answer. It requires a personal answer. Is God breaking your, his promises to you? Has he forgotten about you? So my friends, the poet doesn't resolve it. But we have to resolve it. The, the poet is saying, I'm going to put a question out there and you all have to resolve it. See, the application for us today, I, I think, is, is just amazing because, listen, the pattern of sin that we see sometimes from generation to generation, that pattern can be broken by faith in God. I know of a family, a close family, who maybe two, three generations back, a lot of abuse, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of things that just crush the family in sin. So that pattern of, of horribleness, you know, it got broken by the next generation and the grandpa. And the grandpa became a, a follower of Christ as a result of his mom, who was in a horrible, horrible place. So the grandpa broke a little bit of that pattern. Now, don't get me wrong. Grandpa wasn't perfect. But it wasn't as bad, which allowed the father to not be as bad, which allowed the current generation to not be as bad, which allowed the kids to thrive. So in this generational, in this generational brokenness, it can be, it, 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 it can be stopped, but only through faith in God. And I think the, the, the poet realizes this, and I think that's something that we can take with us today. Do not leave from this place without understanding that whatever has happened in the past can be broken. By trusting the Most High God. The other thing that I think we can take with us today is that in spite of rebellion, remember, the poet is among the, the, the people who, who sinned grievously and they're bearing the punishment. The punishment is deserved, if you will. And in spite of this rebellion that they have experienced, God promises hope. And we saw that in a previous, by the way, that's in the third poem, third chapter. And right smack in the middle of that poem, it's like a ray of light. It's like you've been in the winter, dark, no sun, and then all of a sudden the sun peeks out. Everybody's like, oh, it's the sun, and it's gone. We're back in the dark. But you know it's there. In spite of rebellion, my friends, God promises hope. Do you understand that we, we actually rebel, sometimes willingly, sometimes without meaning to, every single week. You all realize that, right? I'm not the only one going like, yeah, yeah, crazy. No, 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 listen. We all rebel every week. <laughs> Some of you are like, Pastor, you have no idea, man. I'm I, more like every day. I don't know, my thick skull doesn't change and just, there I go again. Oh, old patterns again. Well, of course, old patterns, right? Decisions. Decisions become habits. You know the pattern, right? All right, write that down if you don't. Put it in your notebooks. Decisions become habits. Habits becomes lifestyle. 
lifestyle becomes character, and character becomes identity. Do you want me to say it again? All right, I'm going to say it one more time. Write that down quickly. Here we go. <laughs> By the way, hello, folks online. Hi. God bless you. You can write that down, too. Actually, you, you guys, afterwards, you can rewind, right? Just go back to YouTube and rewind. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. All right, here, here it is again. So you take your decisions, and you repeat those decisions enough times, they become habits. And those habits, exercise enough times, become a lifestyle. And that lifestyle, after a while, becomes part of who you're, your character. And that character, if you just keep going on it in the same wrong direction, becomes part of your identity. And it's like a little oak tree. When the little oak tree is this big, you can go with two fingers and pluck it out. I used to tease the kids, no, not my kids, but the youth group a while back. It's like, I can, I can pull an entire oak tree with my two fingers. And they're like, no way. I'm like, want to bet? Like, oh, I know. I'm like, an ice cream. Let's go. I can remove an entire oak tree with just two fingers. I'm like, no way. <laughs> so I don't like <laughs> oak tree. I'm like, no, you cheated. I'm like, no, -uh. it's an oak tree. This little thing becomes that big thing. Yeah. Trust. And in spite of this rebellion, right, patterns of sin can be broken by trust in the Most High God. And then in spite of our rebellion, God promises hope. Which means, my friends, that we must answer the question today. You must answer the question today. Is God breaking his promises to you? All right, what do we do about it? What's the, what's the actions? What can you, why don't you actually just take a stand and make an action today, this afternoon? Here's the first action item. Choose trust. Choose trust. Pursue even when it jumps out of your hands. I want you to imagine this when you, when you chase trust. When you, so chase trust. I want you to imagine a fish that you just caught. And this fish is wiggling, and you think, okay, I got it. But then it jumps right out, and you, you go and you chase it again. I got it. And the reason I think this is helpful, at least for me, is because when I chase trust, and, 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 and I, I say I, I need to go after that, in the middle of the difficulties, it's very easy for me to forget to trust so chase the trust, even if it feels like, I'm not really trusting you. That's okay. Chase it anyway. But pastor, I feel like, okay, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Maybe you're not there. Maybe the, the trust is not fully, fully embraced. But there's moments when there is. Yes? That's when you caught the fish. That's when you caught the trust. So chase trust. Chase trust daily, hourly, minute by minute. I feel like it because it feels like he's against me. Is he punishing me? Well, I don't know, maybe. You and him might know that only. Uh, by the way, don't try to, you know, fix the other person. Like, oh, I, I think God is punishing you. Well, you know what? Maybe maybe he is, but let, 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 let the Holy Spirit handle that. Why? We're messy surgeons. We're messy surgeons. We'll probably kill the patient while trying to fix the patient. Chase trust. Chase the fish. Okay? Here's the second action. After you chase trust, you cling to the scripture. If you're here last week, I had a nice painting here that used to be uh, in, in when I was growing up back in the old country kind of thing and uh, hung up. And it was my mom's very favorite painting. But it was this young lady in the midst of the waves clinging to a cross to save her life. By the way, if you want to see it, it's up in my office. I can, you know, take you there if you, if you wish to see it. But not just chase trust, but cling to the scriptures. Cling to the scriptures. 
Why the scriptures? Well, my friends, listen. It's the foundation of what we know. This is what we know. Okay? Now, if we take this and say, well, I'm not so sure, what do you got left? Not a much, a gut feel, you know, depending on what, if you had lasagna or if you had pork chops, your feeling might be different. So without the scriptures, we are as planted and so secure as if we have our feet right smack in midair. So we got to cling to the scriptures. It's what we've got. And the moment we take this and say, well, yeah, but we got nothing. Not only we got nothing, we just got our own feelings. All right, let me move on to the third point because we got to go clean some roads and paint some rocks. Chase trust, cling to the scriptures, and then choose hope. Choose hope. In the middle of difficulties, you don't feel like hoping. You've got to choose it. You, if you've actually got to make a choice about that. Calamity, distress can keep you in the darkness. So when you're in the darkness, you'd be like, well, I'm in the darkness. What do I do? Well, that means you, 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 you trust in the one that comes to offer hope. And that is Jesus of Nazareth. Some of you today need to make that step. I need to cling. I need to trust. I need to chase the trust because it doesn't feel it. And I need, to, I need to cling to the scriptures where they're telling me. And then I need to choose hope. I need to choose the one that can offer hope. It, 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 we have no, no, listen, I don't think we have any other option. I mean, what other option is there? Hopelessness? That ain't working. Trying to live over and over again, well, there's not a whole lot of good evidence for that either. Well, pastor, all I, you know, I, I just believe that once, you know, once you die, you die. There's nothing afterwards. All right. But what if you're wrong? Hey, what if you're wrong online? You got nothing to lose if you chase after trust. You got nothing to lose. You got nothing to lose if you cling to the scriptures. And there's really nothing to lose when you choose hope and you say, Lord Jesus, in this world, I got nothing, so might as well, I'm going to hope in you. Would you teach me to shore up my trust in you? And maybe, I mean, I've, I've, I've given you this example before in the past. Imagine a little kid. Then we're going to jump this big step here. That's a big step for little kids. I said, well, you, you trust me? You want to take my hand and let's do it together? Yeah. Who's holding who? Right? How much strength does the little one need to have if I've got him? Their little tiny hand will be like, hey, I'm holding on. If, yeah, kid, sure you are. I'm holding on. Same thing with the Most High God. You might be thinking, oh, I'm holding on to God. Yeah, kid. He's holding on. So that's why I'm saying just a little bit of faith, a little bit of, you don't need a whole lot. Just, Lord, I, I'm here. I want it. Okay. But I don't feel the whole thing. So what? Just wait until you jump. Huh? Yeah, he's got you. Let me pray with you, and then I'll bring Dan up here. Heavenly Father, help us to trust you. Thank you for the love that you have shown us. Thank you that you will not let go, even when we are rebellious, even when we have done things in the wrong way. Even then, you still love us, you still chase after us. Lord, help us to chase trust, to chase you. Help us to hang on to you, even those deep moments. Give us strength after that to, to be rooted in you, and to mature in the knowledge 
that all your promises will come true. I pray for those who are here that are toying with the idea of trusting you. May they take the leap. Do not let them go, Heavenly Father. I also pray for those who might be contemplating baptism. Bring them closer, Father. I pray all this and, and also pray for the safety of our workers today. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.